Welcome to this short teaching video on gas stabilization exercises in central vestibular disorders. First, I'd like to give an overview on the vestibular system itself and then present you the key aspects of my bachelor's thesis. In the last part, I will present you some of the exercises that were used in the included studies. The peripheral vestibular system is the anatomical structure in the inner ear we picture when we speak of the vestibular system. It contains these semicircular canals who registrate angular motion. So when we move our head horizontally, up and down, or when we tilt our head. The otolid organs, the utricle and the saccule, they register linear motion. For example, horizontal motion when a car accelerates or vertical motion when we move up in an elevator. The information is sent by the vestibular nerve or the eight cranial nerve to the vestibular nuclei in the brainstem. The brainstem is a part of the central vestibular system. It sends the information also into the cortex and projections into the cerebellum. There are also two descending pathways from the brainstem. One is the vestibular ocular reflex and the vestibular spinal reflex, which are two very important vestibular reflexes for maintaining balance and stable vision. Damages to the vestibular system, either peripheral or central, can result in the following symptoms. Dizziness, vertigo and imbalance. For gaze stabilization exercises, especially the vestibular ocular reflex, is important to understand. Simply put, the reflex stabilizes vision on the retina of the eye when you move your head and you fix an object. It works as follows. When you turn your head to the left side, the right semicircular canal works excitatory, while the left one works inhibitory. This has for a result that the eye muscles for eye movement to the right side are activated as seen in the graphic. And now on to the key aspects of my bachelor's thesis, where I wanted to find out what effects these case stabilization exercises have on balance in central vestibular disorders. The balance assessments that were used were the Time Up and Go test, the Berg Balance Scale and one of the studies used the Center of Pressure Sway Velocity Measure. To show you the differences pre and post intervention of control and intervention group, I calculated the change score with the median or the mean values that were given in the studies. So let's have a look at the Time Up and Go scores. Here we see four studies that used the Time Up and Go. On the left-handed side, we have Sao and all and Correa et al. These studies studied stroke patients. Mokter et al. studied cerebellar ataxia patients, and some Pieri and Fabio studied progressive supranuclear palsy patients. We see that the tendency is that the intervention group improves better than the control group, but only two of the studies showed significant results, and there were the two studies on the left-handed side who studied stroke patients. But here, for the time up and go scores, no MCID is known. So we don't know if these effects could also be clinically important. The Berg balance scale was used by three out of six included studies. The two studies we've already seen with the significant results in the time up and go scores, they also have significant results in the Berg balance scale. As well as the third study, Gandhi et al, who studied cerebellar attacks of patients, also reported significant effects. It is to note that Gondianol showed a high risk of bias, so these results might be interpreted carefully. For the birth balance scale in stroke patients, I did find an MCID value, 4 points for unassisted walking and 5 points for assisted walking. And both studies, Sao and Coreanol, showed that the difference was clinically important. Let's move on to the last study from Mitsutake et al, which was the only study that used the center of pressure sway velocity measurement. And it was also different in the aspect that it was only a one-time intervention of 10 minutes. The study also differentiated between PCS and non-PCS patients, which meant posterior circulation stroke and non-posterior circulation stroke. 
This is important because the vestibular cortex is believed to be supplied by the posterior circulation. As you can see, there were four conditions that were measured, two static conditions and two dynamic, each with eyes opened and eyes closed. More importantly, for the vestibular system and for gaze stabilization exercises is to look at the dynamic conditions. Only intervention groups did report significant differences between pre- and post-intervention. It is to be noted that the PCS group improved in both dynamic conditions, while in the non-PCS groups they improved only in the dynamic conditions with eyes closed. There is no MCID values reported for the center of pressure measurement for stroke patients. So we don't know if these changes are really clinically important. In this last part, I will show you four case stabilization exercises. You can use an X as a target for the first exercise or simply use a pen or your finger. In the first exercise, you put your target in front of you. Then you move your head horizontally from left to right, while the target must remain in focus. In the second exercise, the target moves horizontally to one direction, while your head moves in the other direction. The third exercise is the saccadic eye exercise, where you switch your gaze from left to right while the head remains still. Only move as fast as you can keep focus. In the last exercise, the smooth eye pursuit, the target moves while your head remains still. The eyes always have to keep the target in focus. As a progression, you can modify or add difficulty by adding vertical and diagonal head movement, by changing the distance of the target, as well as the background, by changing the position and changing the head speed. Recommendations for dosage is unclear in literature, but there have been clinical practice guidelines by Hall and all who published recommendations for unilateral and bilateral vestibular hyperfunction.